29, we said we would start promptly at 10.30, so we are here in place. If you have your device in your hand, if you would go to Tyron Delvin Robbins through the ministries and share so others can look in and watch. At this time, we're going to have the Old and New Testament read, read by Dr. Kevin Stafford. Reading for our spiritual edification from the selected Old Testament passage of Scripture, the 23rd number of Psalms. It reads thusly The Lord is my shepherd, I have all that I need. He lets me rest in green meadows, He leads me beside peaceful streams. He renews my strength. He guides me along the right paths, bringing honor to his name. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I'll not be afraid, for you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. You honor me by anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessings. Surely, your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life. I will live in the house of the Lord forever. That's the 23rd number of Psalm in its entirety. Let me share in your hearing from the New Testament passage of Scripture, 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, beginning our reading at verse 51, down through an inclusive of 55. It reads this way. But let me reveal to you a wonderful secret. We will not all die, but we will all be transformed. It will happen in a moment, in the blink of an eye. When the last trumpet is blown, or when the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to live forever. And we who are living will also be transformed. For our dying bodies must be transformed into bodies that will never die. Our mortal bodies must be transformed into immortal bodies. Then, when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, this scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? This is the word of God for the people of God. And all praises be unto you. Shall we pray? I will be his father in the name of Jesus. We come to you this morning hurting. We have questions. And we know you're the only one with the answer. Father, we seek your presence this morning. Pray now that you would bless this family. That you would touch them with your loving care. And you would touch our hearts this morning. And Father, I pray now for this family, for his siblings, his children, his mother, his brothers. I pray, God, that you would just strengthen them. Reveal your promise that you said you would never leave us comfortless. Father, we seek your strength even now. And Father, I pray a special prayer upon his brother as he comes to proclaim the word. I pray, God, that you would touch him and give him strength to stand. In Jesus' name.
one thing we know for sure is that my brother Lyle is with Jesus and he's going up now.
everybody? Come on, are there any believers in the house that can give God praise? The, the, this is a celebration of life. And I don't want you to be mistaken that our brother, our family member, your friend, this is a man of God. Yes, yes. And so we've come to celebrate his life and his transition in his home going. So one more time, can we thank God for his life? For whatever he meant to you, for all that he means to us. Amen. I want to first of all uh, set protocol and I see Pastor Josh Canales. We want to thank you, sir, for allowing our family to be here. We appreciate you so much. Thank you for opening up the grounds of your campus and allowing us to be here. Can we give Pastor Josh a hand? Thank you. Thank you. He's also one of the students that Rob coached at Carson High School as a little guy, okay? <laughs> and in high school, all right, great. We're grateful to God for you and this uh, beautiful campus is the church that he oversees. I want to also thank God for my brothers and friends uh, that are here serving and sharing with me. Thank you, Bishop Juwan Hilton. Thank you, Dr. Kevin Stafford. I appreciate you. And then also we want to, I want to thank God uh, for the staff and team from the Pilgrim's Hope Bible Church that are here uh, working on the grounds to make sure that everyone is safe and that we're following regulations. Grateful to God for all of you. Thank you so much. And then finally, uh, we want to also thank the Serenity Mortuary. Thank you, uh, Overseer Pitchford, for caring for our dear brother in these challenging and hard times. All right, we're going to move right along with the program as it is printed. And uh, we ask that you would come in that order and that you would remain uh, in the timing that we have given. Uh, first, as an Omega man, Basilis Charles Ezell, followed, as, at, followed by as a deacon, Reverend Dr. Eric L. Page Sr. And then finally, as my friend, Deacon Forrest Washington. They will come in that order, and then I'll come back, and we will uh, give you the next section of the program. Can we clap as they come one more time? Praise the Lord. Thank you, uh, thank you for having me uh, to speak on behalf of, uh, of a great Omega man, uh, a friend of mine, Brother Robert Otis. Um, my name is Charles Ezell. I'm the boss of Tata Chapter, which serves the Compton community as well as the greater Los Angeles area. Um, Brother Otis was a big part of Tata Chapter, well-known, active, um, served happily, unselfishly, um, always exemplified Christian manhood, which is important to us. Um, you all know that he serves as a deacon, served as a deacon. So his, his life was synonymous, as you'll see, um, as an Omega man, as a deacon, and as a friend, which to an Omega man, a brother and a friend are, are synonymous as well. Um, brother... Otis, my last time seeing Brother Otis, we were uh, giving away food at Gonzalez Park in Compton. Um, he couldn't physically help us, but his support was enough. Yeah. That's what we loved about him. Um, he helped our chapter grow from a smaller chapter to a very large and financially stable chapter and he was a big part of that as well so to the family of brother otis to the friends of brother otis um, and on behalf of the 200 plus members of tata chapter of compton california the city where he grew up and the city where he he served um, we give our sincere condolences to you 
but he left a good legacy. And what I think about, what, what helped me through this, is talking to my brother Saeed Galloway. He worked out with Brother Otis a lot. And I checked in on him to see how he felt. And, and the one thing that Brother Galloway said that, that I think can help everyone here is to understand that Brother Otis was a believer. Yes. He believed. So we know where you go when you believe. And so I'll leave it at that. Thank you for having me. And offer my condolences to the family. I had the distinct pleasure of serving as pastor of uh, Galilee Missionary Baptist Church for well over 10 years and ordaining Deacon Robert Otis. And truly he exemplified ways in which you look and see in a deacon. The best I can say is that good and faithful servant. As you read through the program, you've read perhaps already ways in which he influenced and had an impact upon so many people's lives. And I got a chance to see him and know him as a good friend and a brother. And truly I just want to say thank God for his life and truly he is a good and faithful servant. First, give an honor to God, Pastor Robinson, my pastor, and the family. I just want to thank you all for allowing me to say a few words for my friend, my brother, my brother in Christ, my fraternity brother. 38 years I've been knowing this man. It didn't start off like that, though. And our relationship started, and we didn't even know each other. Back in 1978, we were rivals. He played at Dominguez High School. I played at Compton High School. And we played against each other, but we didn't know each other at that time. Fast forward to spring 83, Fall 83, we both pledged the Mega South Five Fraternity Incorporated. I pledged the spring, and after crossing those burning sands, you know, I kind of like on a sabbatical. I didn't too much care for a while about, I just needed the, the little wounds to heal. But someone came to me and said, hey, it's a, a line over at Bergen. They, they pledge me. And I'm like, so? <laughs> but then he said, one of them is from Compton. I jumped 10 feet up, got dressed, headed over to Bergen. Met Rob. And it really took off after he pledged, after, after he crossed. A friendship was born. We was in, inseparable. You saw me, you saw Rob. You saw Rob, you saw me. Southern California, Northern California, didn't matter. We went everywhere together. And it seemed like our lives kind of parallel. We went to different churches at different times. He became a deacon, I became a deacon. His church, was in turmoil. The church I went to was in turmoil. We both left those churches and we ended up under the tutelage of Pastor Robinson. And our friendship took off even more. We blended two families. Anytime the Otis's did anything, Robert made sure I was there. Even Anytime the Washington's did anything, Rob was there with me. We was inseparable. My grandson is his godson. 
So, what I'm gonna miss about my brother during the holidays, you know, we were both big kids. Rob would call me or I would call him and he'd say, hey, you taping the shows? And I said, yeah, I'm taping them. Are you? And we would always, you know, Charlie Brown, Christmas, Thanksgiving, The Grinch. on at the church, you know, what we could do better as deacons. So I'm gonna miss that about my brother. You know, you know when you have a, a real true friend, certain qualities stands out. And a few of those qualities stood out with Rob. And I'm gonna just name a few. Loving, respectful, Forgiving, positive influence, willing to make sacrifices. That was one, to a fault, that was one of Rob's best qualities. It didn't matter. I know Val used to get on, and I used to get on about Rob. Do something for yourself and not everybody else. But that was just him. He couldn't help it. Inspirational, loyal. That was my brother Robert. You know, you got friends with those qualities, then you know you have a true friend. In closing, I would like to say this. It was an old cliche, and I hope I'm saying it correctly. It says that in this life, or in this world, if there's a person that you can call a friend, you're doing better than most people. And I would like to leave you with this one scripture, Proverbs 18, verse 24. And I want to focus in on the B clause, but I'm going to read the whole scripture. And it reads as such. There are friends who destroy each other. But a real friend stick closer than a brother. That was my brother Robert. He was my brother, my friend. I'm a messy, but I know he's in heaven. He's not hurting anymore. Me and Corey was joking the other day. I said, Corey, my brother took that king and slunk it all the way to the Atlantic Ocean because he don't need it anymore. We laughed. We laughed. God bless you all. Thank you for having me. Take care. We thank God for all of those that came with Life Reflections. We're now moving to our family reflections. And to start off with our family as a niece, uh, niece is coming to hear her boy. Then after that, our siblings will come in whatever manner and order they want to come in and uh, we'll help you get up here. Come on, let's give the family some love. Amen. As Robert, some knew him as Rob, some knew him as little brother, to some he was big bro, some called him nephew, cousin, others called him my friend Rob. 
Today I stand as a representative of the nieces and nephews that joyfully called him Uncle Rob. Yeah. Uncle Rob never missed a moment. Sporting event, school achievement, birthday, graduation. You were guaranteed to hear from Uncle Rob. And it didn't stop there. You know, as I got older, it would just sometimes be a simple phone call. Hey, princess. Learned I'm never too old to be a princess. <laughs> just checking in. Want to see how you were doing. And I know I'm not the only one who received an Uncle Rob just checking in call. Because Uncle Rob truly cared. He wanted to know everything about us. What I was up to what I was into at the moment, what music I was listening to. He wanted to know me as a niece. He wanted to know me as a person. Uncle Rob wholeheartedly loved people, truly did. He chose to live his life by leading with love. And what a beautiful way to walk this earth. And now that he has left this physical realm for peace and rest with our Lord, he leaves behind his legacy of love. And we get to carry that legacy. And we get to continue to lead with love with each new encounter in John chapter 13 verses 34 and 35 Jesus told the disciples love one another as I have loved you so you must love one another by this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another we love you Uncle Rob and we will continue to share your light and your love. The light and the love that you embody. We will carry it and share it with others forever. Thank you. So much family friends and Omega brothers and <laughs> this is truly a celebration of Robert's life and thanking God for him and thanking God that he left an imprint on each and every one of us I'm just gonna say a few words to put my glasses on forgive me <laughs> for many years Robert was the baby of the family before Tyron and Corey were born. He was the apple of his parents' eye, Clarence and Calanthus. And he was showered with love by both of them, by his siblings, Valerie, Clarence Jr., and me, Debbie, and by his immediate and extended family as well. Later in life, Robert embraced his younger brothers, Tyron and Corey, with love and affection, and they showered him with love also. Robert became a great friend of his stepmom, Carrie, who showered him with love too. He was well loved. Robert was like a brother to many family members, to friends, to classmates, teammates, mentees, church members, Robert embraced the biblical truth that God is love, and he loved everyone. Just a few memories. I remember how proud my mom was when she brought home a big trophy with a big crown on top of it from his Little League baseball team. She was there for him 
and there was an, appreci an appreciation of her being the team mom. And before a big high school football game, we would awake to find encouraging gifts on our doorsteps with notes saying, good luck at the game, Big Rob, mostly the girls. <laughs> when I came home from college one summer, dad and mom had brought a brand new bedroom set, nice wood bedroom set, big bed, and I said, you never did that for me, <laughs> but they did it for Rob. <coughs> Rob had a big decision to make his senior year of college. He said, sis, I don't think I'm gonna make the NFL and I wanna concentrate on my studies for my degree. Should I leave the team senior year? I said, you decide, <clears throat> but you should definitely focus on the degree. So he left his college team, Cal Berkeley, senior year. It was a former Cal Berkeley football team alum who was instrumental in helping Robert land his first job out of college. More recently, Robert and Tyron, who also attended Cal Berkeley, their alma mater, they took us on a tour, and Robert proudly pointed out the football stadium. I could tell more stories, but I wouldn't have time to read the poem I wrote for Robert. It's titled, Outstanding. That's the praise he heaped on people who made great achievements. He just said simply, outstanding. Rest in peace, dear brother. Outstanding man that you are. Beckoning all to follow the Christ that you love. Encouraging all to enjoy life with your deep laughter. Remembering the joy you brought to the faces of all who love you. Tackling life's challenges with your team player spirit. Overcoming obstacles in life with your endowed grace and humility. Teaching and coaching others to boldly engage in life and to persevere. Invest in your care, talent, time, knowledge, and wisdom into others. Stronger than a lion and gentler than a lamb. For an outstanding son, brother, uncle, nephew, cousin, friend, and deacon, 1 John 4, 16. And we have known and believed the love that God has to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Thank you so much. to say at this time. I just know that a piece of my heart is gone. Uh, I loved Robert. I loved him as a brother. I loved him as a friend. And I loved him as if he was my son ever since the day mom brought him home. I am ever grateful for your life, for your love. I'm going to miss you. I'm gonna miss you terribly. I talk to Robert every day, several times a day. Uh, and I always got called a good friend of Rob's, but Robert is a good friend of mine. And, and I will let you know that uh, there was a time when I lost my husband that I struggled with my faith and going back to church and Robert would gently encourage me throughout the years. Uh, and I got back in church, uh, and I'm ever grateful for that, Robert. Uh, we talk, we talk about the sermons, we talk about life lessons, uh, life challenges, and I'm just gonna miss a piece of my heart when my mother was ready to depart the earth, she said to me, take care of my baby. And I hope I've done that. I love you. I will miss you eternally. Thank you.
My name is Clarence and I'm Rob's uh, older brother. And on behalf of the family, I'd like to thank everyone for your support, for all the love that you've shown Robert, both during this celebration of his life, but more importantly, throughout his life. So I'm six and a half years older than Robert. And uh, what that means is growing up, I got to experience the adoration that you get when you got that kind of separation from a younger brother. Everything that I did, my friends did, Robert looked at us in awe. Uh, he walked around, even though it was simple stuff that anyone our age would do. When he was five, we were 11, we were 12, and it was awesome from his perspective. That continued when he was 11, and we were 17, 18. But that adoration began to flip over the course of Robert's life. I mean, it started simply, and uh, obviously with his athleticism. As he got in a little league where he just dominated uh, into high school and football and college. Uh, but it really continued and got richer after that as I really began to, to watch him live out the gift that God had really given him. God gives every member of the body a special gift, and in Rob's case, that gift was teaching. And Robert was a great teacher. He taught young men a lot of important things that helped them develop in life. He used the experience that he gained as a teacher there to expand and teach men and women, young and old, very important things about their lives and their relationships with God. And it is just a thrill to have watched him grow through life with true adoration. The real irony of this ceremony is that Rob's not here with us physically, because this is a kind of ceremony, a gathering of family and friends that he just loved and thrived in. And the celebrations were always richer because Robert was a participant, an organizer, and following up on them. But he's gone on to receive his blessing from the Lord for living his life out to the fill and really, really, really living God's plan for him as a teacher. So again, thank you all for everything you've done for the family. We truly appreciate it. generous, always placing others over itself type of guy. Just an amazing, outstanding overall person, always encouraging, always there for every big moment in my life. He never missed an event. He was at every graduation. He was at my wedding, every birthday celebration. He was there for the birth of both of my daughters. It doesn't matter what the occasion was, Rob was there. And it hurts me to know that he won't be here with me physically to celebrate the upcoming big moments and celebrations in my life. But I know that he'll be here with me in spirit. 
I decided to use the majority of my time on Rob's final days of life prior to him going to be with the Lord. From the time he was admitted until towards the final days, Rob had been making great progression and getting better every single day. He was aware, he was alert. He was able to move his arms, his hands, his feet, his eyes were open. <laughs> he was talking to me. He cracked jokes. <laughs> he asking about people, checking on everybody. <laughs> Wanting to know how everybody was doing. You know, he was just being Rob. You know, that's how Rob is. The funny thing is, uh, I went up there one day and they were telling me all this stuff that he couldn't do. They were like, he can't, uh, He can't move, can't move his arms, his limbs, and all of that stuff. I came in there, I was like, hey, what's up, big Rob? This is your brother, man. This is your baby brother. And the Rob started moving immediately. His eyes was open, he was moving immediately. They said he couldn't move his arms and stuff. I FaceTimed Uncle Mooch one time, and man, Rob up there trying to throw up the cue sign in the thing. <laughs> Literally. And, they're talking about he can't put his arm in the air or nothing. Rob holding his arm up like this, doing all type of stuff. Just showing up, you know, and so that's who he was. He was a fighter. And uh, yeah, he just was joking and everything, man. It was, you know, surreal. And so I went back and looked at a few notes and bookmarks that Rob had made in the Bible just five weeks ago. It was actually the week, the week of March 15th. And it was interesting to see some of the things that he had highlighted and bookmarked in the Bible. I'm going to share just a few. First, First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 10 and 11. Christ died for us so that whether we are dead or alive, when he returns, we can live with him forever. So encourage each other and build each other up just as you are already doing. This is, again, this is Rob's bookmarks and notes in his Bibles from just five weeks ago, okay? This one struck me. As for me, my life has already been poured out as an offering to God. The time of my death is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race, and I have remained faithful. And now the prize awaits me. The crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. And that prize is just not for me, but it's for all who eagerly look forward to him appearing. He has some verses about being a deacon, but the crazy thing was he really focused on 2 Corinthians chapter 5 where it talks about new bodies. It says for that when we for that when this earthly tent we live in is taken down, that is when we die and leave this earthly body, we will have a house in heaven, an eternal body made for us by God himself and not by human hands. We grow weary in our present bodies and we long to put on our earthly bodies like new clothing. For we will put on heavenly bodies, we will not be spirits without bodies. While we live in these earthly bodies, we will groan inside. But it is not that we want to die and get rid of these bodies that clothe us. Rather, we want to put on new bodies that these dying bodies will be swallowed up by life. God has prepared us for this, and as a guarantee, has given us the Holy Spirit. So we're always confident, even though we know that as long as we live in these new bodies, we are not at home with the Lord. For we live by faith and not by sight. I could go on and on. It was a lot that I saw, but... Just looking back at it, I'll leave you with this. Reflecting on the actual day that he passed, Wednesday, April 7th. And I didn't look at it at this time when I was there with him that day. As I'm looking and just believing God for a recovery, a miracle, I'm like, all right, Rob is, again, Rob is progressing. He's going to get out of here, everything, you know. But as I said, as I went back and looked at those notes and everything that he wrote, it kind of was almost like Rob knew. It's kind of like, God gave Rob the heads up. And you kind of, you want to have that relationship with God if you can, you know? 
So reflecting on the day he passed, Wednesday, April 7th, I was there with Rob from about 11.30 a.m. to 12.15 p.m. Like I said, certain things stand out to me that day that I really wasn't paying attention to while I was there. I remember as I was about to leave, I said, all right, Rob, I'll see you tomorrow. He had just requested his glasses, a Bible, and a book. I said, okay, Rob, I'll see you tomorrow. I'm going to bring your glasses, your Bible, and your book tomorrow, okay? And I was like, I love you, man. I shook his hand, and I turned to walk out the room. As I turned to walk out the room, he called me back. He started asking about things, the church, the family, all of the siblings, of course, my daughters. And then, you know, he tried to say something to me that I really couldn't understand. And I just remember telling him, I was like, you know what, Rob, just relax, man. Get your rest. Don't worry. You can tell me tomorrow. And I was like, you know, how are you feeling right now? And he said to me twice, he said, man, I'm just ready to go home. I'm just ready to go home. Me being a little brother, having faith, thinking that, you know, I'm like, let's get you out of here. I'm like, yeah, man, we about to you keep listening to the doctor, keep doing what the doctor is saying. We're going to you're going to be home in no time. We'll have you out of here. Just so happens I go home, uh, get a call. Rest is history, man. I rode up there, uh, broke every law in the world to get to the hospital. I just was thinking like, maybe if Rob heard my voice one more time, if I could just get in there and be like, hey, big bro, this, this is your little brother, man. I thought that maybe he would snap out of it, but that's the selfishness in me. I just wanted Rob to still be here with me. I take great peace and joy in knowing that Rob is with Jesus. And I'm a missile, man. Like, that's my big brother. I'm a missile. I love him. That's all. Shelton and I was one of Rob's adopted nieces. He was my uncle Rob and I am privileged to stand before you today to honor his life and his legacy. I have a resolution from the city of Carson. It reads, the city of Carson, California, in loving memory, the city council extends its deepest sympathy on the passing of Robert Otis, in whose memory the council will adjourn in tribute and reverence at its meeting on April 20th, 2021, signed Mayor Lula Davis Holmes. Letter of condolence from Greater St. Stephen's Full Gospel Baptist Church, celebrating the life of Brother Robert Otis, April 9th, 2021. Dear Pastor T. Delbert Robinson and family, greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. On behalf of myself, Bishop Morton, and the entire Greater St. Stephen's Church family, I wanted you to know that we are saddened to hear about the passing of your brother, Brother Robert Otis. You and your family are in our thoughts and prayers. Brother Otis touched many lives. He will be forever remembered and forever missed. May the outpouring of love you have received serve as a reminder to you and your family of how much he was loved by all who knew him. Pastor Robinson, if you are in need of anything, please do not hesitate to reach out to your church family for our support. May God continue to provide you and your family comfort. Your church family, Pastor Deborah B. Morton, Senior Pastor, Greater St. Stephen, Full Gospel Baptist Church. 
Letter of Resolution for the Family of Deacon Robert Charles Otis. On behalf of Stephanie Walker and myself, Founders, Bishop Paul S. Morton Sr. and General Overseer, Dr. Deborah B. Morton, along with the entire Full Gospel Baptist Church Fellowship International Family, we wish to extend our deepest and most heartfelt sympathy to Pastor T. Delbert Robinson and Lady Jasmine Robinson and the entire family of Deacon Robert Charles Otis. It is our prayer that the family finds comfort in the fact that Deacon Otis's death was not a surprise to God. Consider the words spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. Before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you. These words affirm that God not only is conscious of our being, our, of our beginning, but he also assigns death as a means to lead us back to him. Because our God knows all things, we have great hope that the Holy Spirit will lead through, through, through this time of transition. Undoubtedly, your family has pro, uh, provided comfort to many during times of hardship or crisis. We ask that you allow the full gospel family to comfort you as you have comforted others. We will remain in prayer as you continue to adjust to Deacon Robert Charles Otis's departure. We pray that the Lord grant you strength as you deal with this life-changing event. We are confident that earth has no sorrow that heaven cannot heal. Do not cry as those who have no faith, for in due time, God will wipe away all tears. Respectfully submitted, Joseph W. Walker, International Presiding Bishop, Paul S. Morton, Sr., Founder. Resolution and loving memory of Deacon Robert Charles Otis. In his own way and for his own purpose, God has called from labor to reward a beloved family member, Deacon Robert Charles Otis. As we celebrate the life of Deacon Otis, we take this method to uplift the pastoral family, Sister Carrie Otis, Brother Corey Otis, and other family members. Our deepest sympathy is extended to his loving and caring family as they go through this time of bereavement. We deem it proper to send this resolution in honor of Deacon Otis. We, the Pilgrim's Hope Bible Church family, recognize Deacon Otis as one who truly loved and worshiped God. We honor his leadership as a teacher of the word, a prayer warrior in our devotional period, and a strong supporter of his brother, Pastor Robinson. As our spiritual leader, supporter of the men's ministry, brave, and every ministry of the Pilgrim's Hope Bible Church. Whereas, Deacon Otis will always be remembered for his chuckle, his famous laugh. We will miss the fellowship he shared with the church family. He always demonstrated great faith in the word and promises of God. His many friends will miss him being in their midst. Be it resolved that we embrace the family and share with them that we must accept the divine will of God who knows best through our hearts though our hearts will be saddened but comforted, knowing that God gives strength to his children. Be it resolved that we thank God for a life well spent, and we know and we know he will console our hearts and console those who love Deacon Otis. His life is not the end, but the beginning of everlasting life in Jesus, whom was his hope and his trust. Be it resolved that a copy of this resolution will be given to the family and a copy will be kept in our church archives. Humbly submitted this 19th day of April, 2021, the administrative staff, Dr. T. Delbert Robinson, senior pastor, teacher, and prophet. If you have a copy of the obituary, you can read along with me. 
as we reflect on the legacy of Deacon Otis. It says a legacy of family, of faith, family, and fellowship. Robert Charles Otis was born to Calanthus Hall Otis and Clarence Otis Sr. on August 1st, 1962 in Los Angeles, California. He was the fourth of their children, following older siblings, Valerie, Clarence Jr., and Deborah. After spending his early years in the Watts community of Los Angeles, Robert moved with his family to Compton, California in 1971. A storied athlete during his middle school years, Robert starred in football and baseball. He was a stellar, a stellar student and football player at Compton's Dominguez High School, graduating with honors in 1980. During this time, Robert was also active at Galilee Missionary Baptist Church in Los Angeles, where his mother was a deaconess and his father a deacon and member of the Board of Trustees. Following his graduation from Dominguez, Robert enrolled at the University of California at Berkeley. While there, Robert was a proud member of the Golden Bears football team, a founding member of Omega Psi Phi fraternity, Epsilon Mu chapter, and a much respected leader in the black student community. During his years at Berkeley, Robert experienced heartbreaking tragedy when his mother Calanthus passed away unexpectedly in September 1981. With his deep faith in the Lord and the support of his family, teammates, and classmates, Robert pulled through, remaining a rock on the football team and graduating from Berkeley in 1984 with a degree in social science. Manhood, scholarship, perseverance, and uplift would remain as intertwined cardinal principles during Robert's life. While building his career in security support at Morgan Stanley, Washington Mutual, and Smith Barney, Robert also dedicated himself to the values of family, faith, and fellowship. In 1983, his father remarried and Robert's family extended to include a stepmother, Carrie Robinson Otis, a six-year-old brother, Tyron Delbert Robinson, and in 1985, a new baby brother, Corey Kiwan Otis. Robert's faith journey including, included ordination as a deacon at the Galilee Baptist Church, and starting in 2009, a deacon, a deacon at Kingdom Builders Christian Fellowship in Los Angeles, which was pastored by his brother, Tyron. Robert later followed Tyron to Pilgrim's Hope Baptist Church, also in Los Angeles, where he served as a deacon, men's ministry cohort, and Sunday school teacher. Robert took tremendous pride in helping to positively shape the lives of everyone he encountered in the church community, with a particular focus on young people. For Robert, family closely followed faith while his immediate family was large, his extended family was significantly larger. Robert's father, Robert's father, Clarence Sr., was the eldest of 12 brothers and sisters, and his mother, Calanthus, one of six, providing him with 16 aunts and uncles, as well as dozens of first cousins. In this large family, Robert took a leadership role in pulling the clan together reveling in the many stories about family adventures and misadventures. In Robert's telling, the stories were funnier and more memorable, even in those instances where he had not been a witness or participant, but was simply relating the off-told tales of others. In these stories, Robert's wit clearly came through, but so did his love and affection for his parents, brothers and sisters, and many, many aunts, uncles, and cousins. Without Robert, the stories will never be as merry, nor will they be as uplifting and unifying. Even with his passion for his faith and family, Robert had plenty of energy left to fellowship deeply and meaningfully 
with his many friends and with others in the community. As a friend, Robert was the one who was always there and always ready with an infectious laugh and wonderfully memorable and often hilarious story. Wise counsel, an encouraging word, and always kind dependability. As a volunteer, Robert provided coaching, mentorship, life skills, and most importantly, love to young men on the Carson High School, Westchester High School, and Sarah High School football teams, and to numerous Pop Warner football players in the South Los Angeles metropolitan area. Again, the stories Robert told were legendary, especially when reminiscing about the play. The Golden Bears winning last second touchdown return through a premature on-field celebration by the opposing team, by the opposing band on, in one of his Cal team's rivalry games with Stanford, or his city champion 1993 Carson High School coach. Big Rob was always there for them, like he was for so countless others. He was also active in the Tau Tau chapter of Omega Psi Phi fraternity organizing and working in youth leadership conferences, Meals on Wheels events, and the annual holiday food giveaway. Robert departed this life and entered the eternal kingdom of the Lord on April 7, 2021. He leaves behind his sister Valerie Jackson of Orange, New Jersey, and her daughter Ayanna Jack Jackson of Johannesburg, South Africa, and Brooklyn, New York. His, br his brother, Clarence Otis Jr. of Orlando, Florida, and his wife, Jacqueline Bradley, and their children, Calvin, Randall, and Allison, all of New York City, New York. His sister, Deborah, Fo Deborah Foy of Orlando, Florida, and her husband, James Foy, and their daughter, Tahira of Los Angeles, California. His brother, Tyron D. Robinson of Los Angeles, California, and his wife, Jasmine, and their children, Tahira and Trinity Robinson of South Bend, Indiana, and Elvin and London Ross of Atlanta, Georgia. His brother and his best friend, Corey K. Otis of Paramount, California, and his wife, Chris Starr, and their daughters, Courtney and Chloe. His stepmother, Carrie R. Otis of Carson, California, and a host of other relatives and friends, all of whom are richer for having been blessed to know him. Christ has called Robert home to praise God and rest in his loving peace and paradise. After Robert's lifetime of dedication to faithfulness, family, and fellowship in the community, the Lord God has proclaimed to him as he proclaimed to the faithful church in Philadelphia. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength, have kept my word and have not denied my name. Revelation three and eight. Perhaps you sent a lovely card or sat quietly in a chair. Perhaps you sent a funeral spray, and if so, we saw it there. Perhaps you spoke the kindest words that anyone could say, and perhaps you weren't there at all, but just thought of us that day. Whatever you did to console our hearts, we thank you, the Otis family.
Martha meets Jesus outside of their village community and she opens up this one verse by using a conjunction if. She makes a presumptuous statement within her mind. And for Martha, that presumption was actually valid. It was actually true. It was factual to her. When you understand the backdrop of this text, Lazarus was a good friend of Jesus, possibly even one of his best friends. And Jesus definitely was close to this family. But in Martha's argument to Jesus one-on-one, -on -one, she provides a conjunctive statement and she says, if. Every one of us in this space this afternoon has faced the possibility of Jesus not arriving quick enough. All of us in our lives have had to endure some ifs. If only I had a little more time. If only I had a little more money. If only I had a little more space. Which shows us our first point in the text. When she said, Lord, if only it shows us the possibility of Jesus' arrival. She puts that conjunction there and she says, if possibly you had arrived sooner, the outcome would not be what it is right now. We move from the possibility of Jesus' arrival to looking at the position of Jesus's availability because the text says that he was elsewhere doing ministry could it have been brothers and sisters that Jesus just wasn't available at the time that friends and family needed him most see the theological challenge in this passage is Jesus actually could not be everywhere all at the same time. Because had he been everywhere all at the same time, this would be called omnipresence. Why is it that Jesus in John 11 can't be everywhere all at the same time? I'm glad you're asking. Because in his earthly ministry, even though he was 100% God he was also 100% man see his humanity in this passage prevented his omnipresence however this text is tailored to teach us and it shows us that when they got word to Jesus informing him of Lazarus's illness he did not move immediately simply because his character was on display and the power of his name was about to be demonstrated. How do you know he didn't move right away? Because when you read the entirety of the narrative and you journey back up to verse number six, the Bible says clearly that he stayed where he was for the next two days. Was it that Jesus wasn't available or was it that Jesus needed a place and a space to show that he had all authority in his control? Brothers and sisters, allow me as I'm moving toward a close here to pause parenthetically as I peruse the perimeter of this passage and I say to you, I really don't like it when Jesus doesn't move fast enough for me. Jesus, why would you stay where you are for two days when you need it right now? See, I love, I, I wish I had somebody that could talk with me here. I love everything about his outcome. I love his blessings.
blessings. I love his benefits. I, I, I'm a beneficiary of what he does. But sometimes the way he operates, it hurts. And it creates heartbreak. And can I be honest? There are times where that hurt and that heartbreak together, it literally produces hell on earth. Maybe there's somebody here this afternoon that can agree with me that when it seems like Jesus is not available and it seems like you're operating on possibility, he's not in position to do what you need, it's going to be a hurtful day in your life. Martha, if you'll allow me to use my eisegetical, sanctified imagination, Martha literally says, they didn't need you badly there as badly as we needed you right here. If you had been here, y'all got to excuse me, I'm preaching for my brother here. If you had been here, Martha is saying, uh, the situation would have turned out different, differently. And I submit that when you go through hurt, and you go through heartbreak, and you go through hard moments here in this earth, it will always be the result of, watch this, when Jesus is there does not match your here. Because sometimes Jesus may seemingly be over there when you need him to be right here. And the other day, me and Corey, it looked like we were wondering, why is it that Jesus is not available? Why is he taking his time about healing Rob? Why is it that he seems like he's over there? Has there anybody ever been through that before? It seems like he's there, but you need him right here. Text says he stayed where he was for the next two days. Notice she starts off with possibility. She says if. Then she challenges his position and his availability. If you had been here. But then she tries to backtrack and said, my brother went out and died. In essence, she said, but I know you have power. Not only does Jesus have power, but in this, even in his earthly ministry, because I have preachers and Bible readers and Bible students that Rob has touched in the room, you understand that even in his earthly ministry, by now, the book of John alone shows you he has power. He had already turned water to wine. He had healed from afar, that centurion's son. He made the lame to walk at the pool of Bethesda. He fed the masses of 5,000. He walked on water. He gave sight to the blind. In other words, Martha is saying, I know you got power, but you just didn't get here in time. But now, allow me, if you will, to shift from observing Jesus's earthly ministry to looking at Jesus' eternal ministry. Because in the earth realm, we understand Lazarus was raised from the dead. But for us, on this afternoon, that's not the case. This is where we got to shift from our earthly thinking into an eternal capacity. Look at it here. For you and I, when we talk about Jesus ministering to us. Martha says, I see now you can't be everywhere all at the same time. Because everywhere you go, you got to go on foot. But for you and I, his timeless, his timeliness is impeccable because everywhere he goes now, he doesn't travel on foot, he travels on your faith. And when he travels on your faith, it's because he can find a believer on earth that has faith. He can have, he can find somebody that says, in thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. He can find 
somebody that can say, I trust in the Lord and do good. Yeah. Yeah. Wherever a believer has faith, uh -huh. Jesus will always show up. Yeah. Yeah. But you got to allow me as a close to grapple with my own humanity. Because David Val, I'm trying to figure out what happened with Rob the other day. I'm trying to encourage Corey, but I gotta encourage myself. Because the main question comes up: did my faith fail? Because my faith said whenever there's a believer with faith, he will show up. I mean, I gotta ask, and I know you gotta ask, because we all know that Rob was a church guy, a deacon, a teacher, a man of faith. Did all of our prayers not work? I mean, did the, did the calls, the emails, the text messages, Corey, did the FaceTime stuff, did that not have an impact? Did, did, did our care and our concern, did it not connect with heaven? See, all of that stuff worked. I had to pray about it. The Lord said everything you did, it worked. But sometimes when we pray, we pray for power, but we pray for power from the wrong position. I couldn't see it straight until Kevin, I looked at Philippians chapter 1, verse number 21. And it says that for me to live means living for Christ. Yes, yes. Paul said, and dying yes. is even better. He said, if I live, I can do more fruitful work for Christ. So I really don't know which is better. He said, I'm torn between two desires. King James says he was betwixt, between uh, two straits. He said, look, I'm longing to go be with Christ. Which would be far better for me. Yeah, yeah. He said, but for your sake, it's better yeah. that I stay here and continue to live. Right, then I got it there. Right. I said, I get it now. Right. Paul said, I'm going to stick it out. Yeah, yeah. But Rob said, it's far better for me to go and be with the Lord. Yes, yes, yes. Oh God, I wish I had a little more time, but brothers and sisters, you got to understand Rob had power to make a choice. And according to the text, when Paul said it was far better, I submit to you this afternoon that Rob chose the far better choice. He executed his power. He mustered up his strength. That phrase there, oh, that phrase there, better means after Rob had walked in power. I know he had immobility issues, but Rob was a man of power. I wish I had somebody here. Let me let, me let you in on a secret. Not only was Rob a man of power, he was a man of purpose, but he was also a prophetic man. When Rob spoke, things came to pass in an unusual and supernatural way. He, he mustered up the power, and that phrase, far better, means that he literally took God's flag of victory and stuck it in the sands of time. And I can hear Rob saying, I fought a good fight. I wish I had time and I had some textbook here. Rob said, I finished my course. And he planted his flag of victory in the sands of time. That's why Paul picks it up and said, our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die. And as a result, death is swallowed up in victory. Yeah. We don't have to locate Jesus. Wondering where he has been. I submit to you this afternoon. Jesus was right there all along. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Brothers and sisters, it's just that Rob made a choice. We prayed for him to stay. But Rob said, I'm choosing the power of far better. I'm not going to have to worry about this cane no more. Dick told you he's slow.
swung it all the way across the Pacific Ocean. Rob doesn't have to worry about immobility issues anymore. Because I can see Rob walking better than he's ever walked before. Rob does not have to worry about the loneliness and isolation of living over there in an apartment all by himself. He had a mother over there. He got a father over there. Loved ones over there. He is now where every day is howdy howdy. And never goodbye. And so as I leave you this afternoon, I want to tell you, good night, my brother. Sleep on, man. I'll see you in the morning time. And some glad morning, when this life is over, guess what, y'all? I'll fly away and be at rest. Let the church say yes. Somebody say yes. Hallelujah. Give him praise. There may be somebody here that could use Rob's transition for your transformation. Somebody can receive eternal life right here, right now. Rob's life is secure and sealed in Jesus. Absent from the body. Rob has been present with the Lord now. For a whole week or better. I hear the words say of, of the hymnologist. John if you will play softly please sir. The hymnologist said when we've been there. 10,000 years. Is verse number four of amazing grace. Bright shining as the sun. Will no less taste. To sing God's praise. Than when we first begun. Rob is experiencing. Yes. The ultimate realm. Of glory. Yes. But you and I. We can make a decision and a choice right now. You don't have to question God. You can take. This small Sunday school lesson. Into any degree of your life. It's always a possibility that. Jesus won't. Be in proximity. When you think you need him. It's always a possibility that he will seemingly be there when you need him right here. But you can make power become a part of your life right now. Rob's transition can be your transformation. Every head is bowed and every eye is closed. Will you repeat this prayer after me? Dear Lord Jesus, I need you now. I need to make a big decision. Will you save me right where I am? Enter into my heart. I'm seizing this moment to confess with my mouth and believe in my heart that you were raised from the dead just for me. And with this confession, I am saved. Holy Spirit, I give you permission to come and live in me. Control my life, and I'll give you my life for the rest of my life. In the name of Jesus, amen. Now listen, my brother and my sister, if you prayed that prayer for the first time, or even the 1,000th time, I want to congratulate you. If you prayed it, not just because I asked you to repeat it, but you know you need to make a transformation in your life. I want to be the first to congratulate you. At a time of transition, in a time of mourning such as this, the miracle of salvation and eternal life has now become a part of your life. For Rob's legacy, for his life, can we give the Lord a great hand of praise? Come on, come on, can we honor our brother? I see you. Can we honor our brother? This is one of this is one of my life's heroes. Best friend. Means so much to all of us. 
Thank you to the men of Omega. We appreciate you so much. Thank you. Thank you, family and friends. Thank you. We're now in the hands of our directors as we will follow their instructions at this time. 